It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this program of 15 Minutes of Grace and Truth, where we get to listen to the Word of God. But before we listen to the Word of God today, let us just take time and worship Him. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and worthy to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord. Praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and worthy to be praised. I give glory to your name, O oh Lord, glory to your name. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O oh Lord, glory to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and worthy. Praised for your name is great and worthy to be praised. For your name is great, your name is great and worthy to be praised, worthy to be praised. There is no greater name than the name of Jesus, and he is worthy to be praised and to be worshipped. Let's open our hearts as we listen to the Word of God today. So good day again to all of us, and as we join again another session of 15 Minutes of Grace and Truth, and it's so wonderful for us to be together, a real joy for us to worship the Lord and I know that this is His will, for us to worship Him, to give our lives for Him. And I want to remind each one of us that we are just looking at the words of Jesus together in the book of Matthew as we consider what Jesus spoke about regarding the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And just in our last session, we considered our path into the kingdom. And there was a narrow gate that Jesus spoke about, uh, reminding us that He is that gate. And today we want to consider our heart, or what kind of heart should we have in this kingdom. And in the 66 books of the Bible, each one of us, we will know that we can discover the heart of God, that God has a plan, and that God has been on a mission. And that mission is for His glory. And in the Old Testament, having established a nation, the nation of Israel as His very own people, and then in the New Testament, through Christ, how He now includes the nations in His plan and in His will, we realize that God wants and desires worshipers of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue. And the greater the diversity united at the foot of the cross, the greater the glory that God receives. And in this session, we would look at the will of God. But I think before we look specifically at His will, it's important for us to consider just two ways that the will of God is expressed in Scripture. And I do know, I understand that we are men 
And how can we know completely the things of God? God is so much higher, so much bigger than what we are. But still, it's important for us to just consider how the will of God is expressed. And on the one hand, we see in Scripture the sovereign will of God or the will of His decree. And it is that will which is in one way His providential will. And we know that this is His unwavering will. It's unchanging. It's this attribute of God that cannot be changed. He won't go against that part of His will. And we see this in verses like Daniel 4, verse 35, where it says, He does according to His will among the hosts of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand. So that means His hand cannot be moved. It cannot be changed. And again in Psalms 115, verse 3, we read that our God is in the heavens and He does as He pleases. And here we have the sovereign will of God. It cannot be changed. It cannot be affected. But then also we have in Scripture the will of God as it contains to His morality. In other words, the moral will of God. Or an alternative is His will of command, which is driven by God's moral attributes. It's driven by His holiness, by His righteousness. So on the one hand, God's will is driven by His sovereignty, and on the other hand, His will is driven by His morality. And this is still His will, understood as His moral command to act in a certain way. And friends, this distinction is important for us to understand. And we see this in 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, where it says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. And here we have in verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, that man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be satisfied in due time. And it is here in verse 4 that we see this moral will of God. We see He desires all men to be saved. And friends, that desire is driven by His righteousness because He cannot stand sin and He wants every man, every woman to be made right before Him. But at the same time, also we can read in 1 John 2 verse 17, whoever does the will of God abides forever. And here we know that this also implies that some don't do the will of God, and some don't abide forever. So although this is His moral will, it's not unchangeable. Here it can change, because in that way we have that choice. And again, the same as 1 Timothy, we see in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, it says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Yet we know that there are some who don't repent. We know that there are some who do, who do perish. And friends, in this way we know, as an example, it is God's moral will for us to be saved, but is not, it is not His providential will or sovereign will that all are saved, because salvation comes only for all of those who believe in Jesus Christ. And having said that, friends, we look at Matthew 7, verse 21, and we consider not every man who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And friends, here we have the moral will of God at work. Specifically here, the will of God is expressed as His will for us to, by faith, accept the completed work of Christ on the cross. And friends, in the same that, that is expressed in 1 Timothy 4 verse 3, 
where it says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And we know, although this is the will of God, we know that not all live in sanctification. But as Jesus confirms in verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And yet, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And friends, we see here that those who call on him were those who were doing it out of their own accord. They were doing so out of their own works, boasting in their own efforts, as if they have accomplished the will of God. But sadly, Jesus declares, I never knew you. And again, we see in Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see here that some were boasting because of their works. Lord, we just did this for you. We did that for you. But Jesus reminds us it's not about works. It's about doing the will of the Father. And we saw that the will of the Father expressed in that verse is that we should come to faith that each one of us should come to faith and accept Him as our Lord and Savior. And this we see clearly in 1 John 3 verse 22. So how, do the, how does the moral law then get expressed? How does Jesus refer to it? And as I said in 1 John 3, it says in verse 22, And whatever we ask we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And friends, that is the will of God. That is a part of his moral will, that all of us shall accept him as savior, that all of us shall come to faith. And friends, here this is the heart of God. We can feel the heart of God, the will of him for us to believe in Christ. And friends, only by believing in Christ are we able to submit to the will of God in this way and obey His command. We can only know God through Christ and we can only know Christ by grace and through faith. And we see, friends, later in Ephesians, we see God's goal for those who do His will. And in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of his Son. Again, friends, this is the will of God. This is the will of God for each one of us and for each one of us to see that God wants to form in us that perfect man. That each one of us, that is the measure of the statues of the fullness of Christ. And friends, as we close, that our heart in the kingdom should be to do the will of God. To do the will of the Father. To have this attitude to submit ourselves to the will of God firstly. But also to have that heart that, Lord, in my life, whatever I do, I want to do and I want to follow your will. However that is expressed. And we see here in these verses, it was expressed as giving and submitting our lives to him by faith, through faith, by grace, as we submit to Jesus Christ. And friends, Jesus is our ultimate example where he said, Lord, not my will be done but yours. Well, we have come to the end of this episode. Thank you for having been with us. And I'm sure that the Word of God has been a blessing to you. I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel and also to get notified of future events. Please just click on the bell that is at the bottom of the screen. You can also write to us. Let us know how things are going. Let us know how these messages are a blessing to you. May God bless you until we meet you next time.